Welcome to The Shakedown, where we talk about criminal justice system from the inside out. My name is Ryan, and coming to you live from my phone from Houston, Texas, is Malone. Hey, I'm Aaron Malone. Each week, we tackle a different question and try to answer it. This week, we're going to ask the question, do we need prisons? And this question is a big question. We're just going to start by saying this is probably going to come up more often. Everyone is probably going to have thoughts. We're happy to have this as an ongoing debate. But for this episode, we're just going to start with our initial thoughts about prisons, why they're, why people think they're here, do we need them, Do why do people think that we need them, and just based on our experience of from being in them for an extended period of time. So most people, their argument for having a prison is that when people commit a crime, what do we do with them? We have to put them somewhere. We don't want them in society. If they do something horrible, we need to get them off the streets. That's by far the standard. And because prisons have been around, you know, prisons are the standard right now, that's where we want to put them. We just want to put people... You know. And most people think that prisons have always been here. Right. Your, your average modern individual never lived in a day and age where they did not have prisons and doesn't know anyone who ever did. His great-grandmother did not live in a day and age that didn't have prisons. So people think that there's something that's always been here and it's something that's just a part of life. It's not. Right. It's the, a relatively new thing. Yeah. Adam and Eve did not have a prison in the Garden of Eden where all the bad people went. This is a relatively new invention, along with police and other things, surprisingly enough. Even nowadays, actually, not all places have prisons. Not all societies use prisons. That's not where they that's not how they deal with people who have deviant behavior. Eskimos that I've read about, they all actually have like these kind of singing duels <laughs> when when there's some sort of conflict that they need to resolve. But they don't they definitely don't this have is a form of punishment for them? This is a fun, it's a form of conflict resolution. So if there's some sort of debate, if you did some sort of wrong, then that's how they determine reparations. This is how they de- determine it. It's been a while since I have read this book. So now I've got, now I'm going to have to, on, it's on uh, Human Destructiveness by Eric Fromm. That's the one who wrote on Human Destructiveness. It talks about societies like the Eskimos that don't use prisons. There, talks about um, societies that are like in, uh, out, I think they're outside of Russia that are just like small colonies. If you're a small farming community, you're not going to build a prison. You know, there's no point in that. They have to find other ways of dealing with disputes. A big dispute is, are you harvesting on somebody else's land? You're stealing from them. That's a lot of, a lot, a lot of stealing. That's a, that's a lot of stealing. <laughs> that's a lot of stealing. I mean, that's grand larceny, <laughs> you know, going through and stealing a whole plot of somebody else's harvest. These, Hard the, work that stealing. Right. The The big thing I, I got from reading about these cultures is that it's not really even about the where what happens when there is a dispute or when something happens and, and the fact that they don't use prison. The bigger part is that the whole community is involved. They get communities involved, and that's a big part of it. I've I've read some uh, very interesting uh, things on this as well of different societies and in, in, in the past and how they dealt with criminals or people with deviant behavior or, for that matter, uh, the insane. A couple of the more interesting ones that I found, the one that captured my imagination the most was when the Shaolin monasteries were the most prominent s- sort of center of communal life in China. Whenever every little city or village surrounded a monastery, had one in, in its vicinity. In some of these places, they would get somebody that they just couldn't, they couldn't deal with. They couldn't get them to stop their, their behavior, you know, so what do you do with them? They would bring them to the monastery. They'd bring them to the monk, and these monks would take them under their, would sort of take them in. They would assign a monk to this person to, to be there next to him, and someone that had exemplary behavior that they wanted to instill within him. Of course, these monks are like kung fu masters, so I mean, the guy's not going to get away from him. The guy's not going to be able to beat him up. He's not going to be able to to, to 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 not do the regiment and all that. I mean, if if, if he decides he's going to get violent, well then, or try to run or anything, the guy was more than capable of stopping him from anything. And they never hurt hurt the person any further than was absolutely necessary. To then to get them back on track, and whenever they felt that the person was ready to be, to uh, to go back to their families, they brought the brand new man out of their monastery to the families. Oftentimes, very enlightened. That story I read right there 
I can remember whenever I was in prison, especially in the early 90s, and things were were very violent and dangerous, and, and the the place was a the place was a lot crazier than the prison that you came to. I sat and I I was at one point was writing a book on this subject on how to turn Texas prisons into a situation like that. In my mind, then I still thought that prisons was an absolutely necessary thing, didn't need to be done away with at all. I just was was trying to come up with a way in which prisons could actually accomplish the said goal of making people better. Of course, I did not really know at the time or really think that people don't really, at the core of the of the problem, is that people don't care if you get better. As a matter of fact, they don't want you to get better. They don't like you and they just want to be rid of you. Right. That is a huge part is that it's just, it is an easy thing to just throw someone into into a prison. You reminded me about when I went to county and to, into jail which is where you're held until before you go to prison. When I was in jail and I was in an ag tank, which is when you have when you have a serious crime, when you have when you've ha- had an assault or a murder or an, a manslaughter or something like that, where you where you've harmed someone, you go to what is called um, ag, which is like an aggravated. Not the- aggravated as in. You are aggravated. Of course, no. probably everybody in jail is a little bit aggravated. Right. But aggravated as in the the charge that you uh, there for is uh, considered to be more severe than than some common misdemeanor. Right. So when when I was there, because my charge was manslaughter, I went to it was an aggravated charge. So I went to the to the ag tank is what they called it with all aggravated offenders. One day, most of the guys there they're twenties and up is what I'm looking at in there. Most of the guys actually are even, are it's, it's late 20s and up. And then all of a sudden, this 16-year-old shows up in the ag tank. And we're all wondering what the heck's going on with this kid. He is scared out of his mind when he gets into this tank. Guys co- start coming up to him and start talking. Well, what had happened with him was that he had been doing drugs and stealing, and his mom was sick of it. This is the first time he got caught by the police. When he made his call to his mom, his mom was so sick and tired of it. She said, you know what? Told the officer, said, you know what? You need to send him to jail so he'll learn. So they did that. And they made they made sure he went to the ag tank. This kid didn't, his dad wasn't around. His mom was the one who took care of him. He comes to this tank and he tells this story and these guys are all over him. They they love him. They all want to look out for him. This kid who's been getting no attention and has no father figure in his life, now he had, like everyone wants to be his dad. They want to go out to the rec yard and play basketball with him. They're laughing and playing jokes with him. He's playing pranks on like these big, these big ass um, dudes. <laughs> like... You, big ass dudes. Yeah, big ass. Like I'm talking. Like yeah, these are guys that I'm not messing with in the county jail, and they're and they're he's sitting around playing pranks on them, like uh, at, at I chow can't time. You said big ass dudes on your podcast. Well, you know we're 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 keeping it real here. So uh, <laughs> it's a prison podcast. It, yes, it's actually very clean. <laughs> <laughs> compared to uh, how we talk in prison. Exactly, especially how I talk. Yeah, I considering we're going back to those days. Yeah, I I expect plenty more, more prison talk, <laughs> prison slang, and uh, cursing to come out. So that's how it goes. Right. Sorry, I, uh, I'm sorry I cut you off. No, back no, big ass dude. That's a good point, and I I'd also like to point out if you hear Malone refer to someone named Brainforest, he's talking about me. Just so everyone not, is aware, not Brainforest, Rainforest. You know your name. Did you say Brainforest? I said rainforest, but I like I kind of like rainforest now. I kind of like that name. I think you need to roll back the tape and see if you actually said rainforest. I'll, I'll we'll check it in editing. I'll I'll verify there. Rainforest but, is Ryan's prison nickname. Oftentimes, people come to prison and get a second name, or some in some <laughs> cases they get multiple names. Right. And if you've noticed, well, you probably probably haven't noticed because you're only listening to him. But Ryan, rainforest has very red hair, and he could have become just another red in prison, of which there are myriads of red, of people no, I, with the nickname red in prison. I was red, but and instead, I was red beard for, yeah, that was one distinguishing way. Yeah, he was red, he was red beard, he's had a lot of, he, he's had many names, but the one that's uh, stuck 
the one that's uh, is is uh, best associated with him is Rainforest because his name is Ryan Forbes, and so Ryan Forbes sounds like Rainforest. Ta-da! Rainforest. And that's what you'll hear me call him from now on because I have no other name for him. I, calling him Ryan is very cumbersome for me. Yes, it, it does sound kind of weird hearing you, you call me Ryan. And I had to. I did that for the first podcast, and it just did not roll off the tongue at all. No. So now people will know who you are, Rainforest. There we go. And you are a hippie. Yes. But you're a very good. You're a very good hippie. I I, I will take it. That's I I don't mind being a hippie. I just don't have I. Don't have the cool long hair, though. You just got the cool soul. Hopefully. So this kid... Yeah, you got the most important part of it. So the kid is there for like a few days or a week. He he came in uh, scared out of his mind, and then he's leaving giving everybody hugs. I don't think whatever lesson was supposed to be learned about how awful uh, jail is and how scary this place is, I don't think any lesson was le- learned from that. Would you have actually... Do you feel that... If he went in there and the worst possible outcome could have happened, he was traumatized by it, do you think that would have helped either? No. I don't think that would have helped his situation. I think as soon as he would have gotten out, he would have done a whole bunch of drugs. Um, You're that, saying it's a bad idea all the way around. All the way around. Because it is not It is not an environment for that. You like, totally un- can understand a mother so frustrated with her child's behavior not being able to get through to him that they're you know seeking – Seeking something uh, to help extreme, them. Extreme, you know, measures and all that. I mean, any, everybody can sympathize with that type of thing. Yeah, I, and I. What I, you're trying to say is, is that it that, that wasn't a good idea. Right, and my mother, my mother did something similar to me. <clears throat> in in my background, whenever I was a teenager, at the age of 13, my mom was arrested and went to prison for conspiracy to manufacture methamphetamines. And at that tender young age, you know, I'm 13, so I'm, I'm just at that phase where I'm entering into my teenage years, right? So I've gone through my whole entire life from day one all the way to 13, living with bikers and my gangster mom and, and people. I'm in, living in this crazy environment where there's, there's, uh, there's drugs everywhere, there's, there's, there's party, there's crime, and there's all these tough, mean people, uh, these bikers that are surrounding me all the time, you know, f- you know, fights, violence, all this type of stuff. Yeah, I, I didn't experience violence against me. The bikers aren't, aren't that kind of people. They're not the type of people that abuse children and so forth. But, you know, the environment wasn't necessarily what you would consider a a stable environment for, for, for most children. But because that was that was where I came from, after 13 years of life, that's all I knew. So my mom gets out of jail. And she's now on part of her deal that she made was that she was going to get 10 years of adjudicated probation. Point of this adjudicated, this is federal time, by the way. Point of this adjudicated probation is if you mess up again, you're going to prison for a long time. They can stack a lot of time. So they they dangle this sword over your head and they force you to get yourself straight with the threat of you're going to be doing 10 years in prison type of thing. So. My mom suddenly got a, a very good motivator to get cleaned up. I've talked to my mom about this, and, and uh, she's very open about it. She's not the same person that she was back then, so please don't judge my mother. She has completely changed her life. But in this early stage of her changing her life, she really didn't know what to do. She had told me that prior to her getting arrested, she had just simply resolved herself to this type of lifestyle. She's like, look, I like drugs. I like this lifestyle. You know, this is who I am. This is what I do. I can't do anything else. I I can't get away from it. I'm just going to, you know, just give myself over to it and do it. She wasn't a bad mom. She didn't neglect us. She made sure that she went to nursing school and she she always had a roof over her head and paid for her stuff. You know that I, I, I lived a much better life than some other people around me. So I'm not complaining about that. Uh, The whole point that I'm trying to make is, though, is that she made a very radical change, a 180 change at that point. And she expected all of us to just all of a sudden make this 180 change, too. And I'm like, I had no idea where this came from. So my mom's, in my mom's mind, she saw the direction I'm going or or that I'm still, uh, you know, kind of, I'm smoking weed and I'm out there living this, you know, running the streets and all that. And I can't be gotten to, you know, because... My mom's life changed so radically, it was so unstable for me. I had, to, I had to get away. I had to run away from home and go live with my cousins or other people that I was familiar with to feel comfortable. This caused my mom a great disturbance. She didn't want me to, you know, to go down the same road that she did. So in an overreaction, she went and had me put on probation. 
she, there's a thing in Texas where you can call voluntary supervision or something where you can take your child down there to the probation office and, and say, oh, I can't deal with this kid. You deal with him and have them put on probation. This is such a bad idea. Don't ever do this to your kid. All you've done after that point is put your kid in the same position that your that my mom was in. You know, what was once something that would get me grounded is now something that can get me sent to jail. And that gives you a criminal record and that start it, it just it's a snowball effect from there. I'm I am not doing anything that all the other teenagers around me weren't doing as well. By the way, you know, I'm not doing anything that's so extreme that everyone else is not doing it. But every time I got in trouble, I literally went to juvenile detention and then eventually started going, I lost my freedom completely. After my mom got out of prison, I ended up going to orphanages and, and, and homes and all this other type of stuff. And, and it was a very counter uh, productive measure to try to in include the criminal justice system in your child's behavior management. Let this be a lesson to you. Do not do that to your kids. It's not gonna work out how you think it is. Maybe desperate, just hold on. Your kid's probably not nearly as bad as you think he is. Well, it, the other big thing is that kids, their brains are not formed yet. Their brain, it's not even just not that their brains aren't formed yet. Like when you're a teen, a teenager's brain works completely differently than a than a an adult's brain. If adult is thinking like a teenager, then they they're insane. They're, they're an insane person. There's something wrong. There's probably a diagnosis in the DSM because the way a teenager, just like you were saying, the way you were looking at it when you were a teenager is like, everyone around me is doing this thing and I want to be with these people around me and that's that's going to be top priority for you at the moment. Right, For te yeah. Because teenagers are all about bonding. That's the time where you're making your friends, it's everything is revolving around what social group you're in, and that's how your brain forms. If someone is doing something, it's more important to go do that thing, even if there's dire consequences for doing it. You're absolutely right. The consequences are something that, that uh, you know, to, uh, the undeveloped, immature brain doesn't quite fully grasp, you know, the, the perspective on time and so forth else, and, and, and that something could be so detrimental that it could cause harm irreparably. Those things aren't really registered in the brain of children and teenagers. And on top of that, then there's the other side of it, that the over-important, making mountains out of molehills type of thing that teenagers do out of every little issue. So, you know, things that... that as adults, you look back and you see teenagers and how they, I, I didn't get to go to the concert. It's the end of the world type of thing. I broke up with this boy. You know, you're, my, my nieces do this all the time. They break up with some boy. It's the end of the world. You know, they're on the verge of suicide because they'll never find anyone else. You're nine. Come on, get over it, girl. <laughs> type of thing. That is the other side of it as well. Is it, it's, 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 a, it's a matter of perspective, really, uh, I think. That, you know, these young, young brains just don't have the depth of life, so to speak, to kind of uh, properly process the consequences of any behavior or any outcomes of events. Right. There's that, there's that aspect of it, but there's also one big thing that, it's true for adults and for children is that everyone is kind of vaguely aware of prison and punishment and even capital punishment. If you ask the person, somebody out on the street, if you go out and drink and drive right now, what's the punishment for it? What, what would you be arrested for? What would the charges be? Unless you've been, you've been caught drinking and driving, I don't think you're going to know the answer to that question. Most people don't know the law in their area. They don't, they don't know what the laws are. They don't know what the charges are. They, even for the bigger offenses, you unless you've dealt with the legal system, you don't know what the specifics are. I mean, I have an intoxicated manslaughter charge. I cannot tell you in the county I got arrested in or even in the county I'm living in right now what a DUI would get you. It's different everywhere. It changes in every situation. It's not consistent. This is supposed to deter people, which uh, to me is unbelievable. Yeah, you're talking about uh, jails as a deterrent and the uh, how punishments are just meted out with, between one person and the next with the exact same crime in, in, in a way that's just, it doesn't even make sense to me. I mean, we, we talked a little, when we mentioned before, you know, well, we've been talking about my past a little bit. I did 30 years in prison. Uh, that was mentioned in the, in the last podcast. And I didn't have to do 30 years in prison. I only had to do 12 and a half years in prison. I came up for parole after 12 and a half years in prison. I went to, I went to prison when I was 17 years old. At the age, right at the cusp of turning 30, I finally came up for parole. And I got turned down over and over again 
for 17 years. I did 17 years longer in prison than I had to. For what reason? For There was absolutely no reason whatsoever. I, it wasn't because of any kind of, of a disciplinary action or anything. It was it, it, the, the reason I was given was his nature of offense. The thing that got me the time that said that I should only have to do 12 and a half years, which was the offense, that the jury determined that, okay, 12 and a half years is enough for, the parole board comes back and decides that, Hey, okay, we don't think you've done enough time. But then there's the guy that's sitting right next to me who came up for parole at the exact same time I had. I, I, I do. I mean, I've seen this over and over again, and it's not just one individual because I came up for parole seven times. But you're sitting, whenever you do come up for parole, you're generally, you get a lay in. Remember, we talked about lay in. And you go into a room, and you're, and you're going to go down there to, uh, it differs on the unit that you go to, but you're generally going to go to somewhere where they have offices on a prison unit. And there's going to be a little inmate area. So it's probably like where they have disciplinary actions or some, you know, lieutenant's office, that type of thing. And you're going to sit down with this group of inmates and they're all coming up for parole. And so everybody's talking about their particular circumstance. Oh, I sure hope I make it. I did this much time on this. And I sure hope I make it, you know, uh, or, or what do you think? Do you think they're going to hold this case against me? Everybody's like talking in the room, you know, the big buzz. We're, we're, you're, you're going to see the uh, on-unit parole person. It's their and plea so you're bargaining. hearing all these different... Yeah, well, you're hearing all the, di- all the different uh, circumstances of everybody's particular life. So here it is. I've got 50 years aggravated for a murder. For a murder in which arguably ha- had some kind of a, you know, I was attacked by the guy. I, we took his knife from him. We didn't have to kill him, but we did. But I'm sitting across the room from a guy who has a life sentence for a home invasion murder where he was going to break, broke into someone's home to steal from them. They surprised him and he ends up killing them. And he, he's got a year or two less done on his sentence than I have on mine. He makes parole and I don't. Less time than this guy's got lesser offense than this guy's committed, more time done on the offense than this guy's got, he gets parole, I don't. You're sitting there looking at this art. This, it, I can only, you can only assume it must be completely arbitrary the way they meet out punishments, the way they meet out rewards, who gets what and, and where, because it just seems like it makes absolutely no sense. So if you're trying to use prisons as a deterrent, I got to admit that, that most criminals most must think that they're going to get away with it to begin with. And if they don't think they're going to get away with it, they can at least kind of cling to the hope that they're going to be one of the lucky ones <laughs> that make their first parole or get a light slap on the wrist because there's, because all of that is, uh, all of that is there. Uh, there was a guy that was on uh string fellow before he was one of the guys that, uh, that left with the, uh, evacuation in 2017. So, Whenever I met you it was after it was after the evacuation. There's the before string. There's the before evacuation and the the post evacuation string fellow rainforest. So so you'll hear me refer to that sometimes. Anyways, this guy's name was Nico. Nico lives out here in Houston somewhere. Nico also had a intoxicated uh, drunk driving case like you. Nico was dry was high as a kite. He's in the car. He's with, he's with a friend. The friend is also high. Gets in a car wreck. The friend that's in the car with him is injured, not killed, injured, gravely injured. He's badly injured, right? So Nico's sitting in jail. His court-appointed attorney comes to him and says, "Uh, the DA is offering you 21 years. He has a prior record, not for drug driving, not for intoxicated, but he has been to to prison for some minor offense before. I'm assuming that's why they came to him with the stiff sentence that they did. 21 years for something like this seems very, very extreme, but they weren't willing to come off with it. He's, he can't believe it. 21 years. I mean, he's going to have to do 10 and a half years just to see parole on this. He goes, he leaves from his visit with his lawyer. He goes back to his cell and there's a newspaper in his cell. And it's a local newspaper and he's reading the local newspaper and there's a recent case that's been tried in this very court that he's in, that, that he's now currently in, where there's a guy, drunk driving, hits a nun on the side of the road and kills a nun and got eight years. Kills the nun and got eight years. So he cut this article out, right? He calls his lawyer back. He gets his lawyer back in there and he hands him the, he hands him the article. He says, read this. And the, and the lawyer reads it and his face just kind of drops. He says, oh, the nun case. He says, well, look, there's things about it. He starts to immediately doing the lawyer thing where he tries to start, uh, where he starts trying to uh, make up, you know, the. there's things you don't know about this case, blah, 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 blah. He says, what is there to know? He says, the guy killed the nun. 
I didn't kill anybody. The guy that got hurt in the car with me was high as a kite too. He said, and he killed the nun, got eight years. No one died in my case. A bad injury of a guy that was also high, he willingly got in my car. 21 years, how does this work? I mean, what's going on here? And uh, it actually, that argument worked in the end of getting the plea bargain reduced down to 11 years. Still more time than the guy that killed the nun. That, that is a very good point you're making about the arbitrariness of, of, of criminal justice altogether in, in Texas. You could, you could talk about that subject for years on end and not, never exhaust it. That was a case of something that happened in the same county. We're dealing with the exact same judges, prosecutors, and all that. I mean, it's, it's just, it's baffling. It makes you, I mean, did somebody get paid under the table? I mean, there's got to be something else going on. I assume that it's not as arbitrary as I think. I, I want to believe that there's some kind of reasoning behind it that they're just not telling me. So somebody knows somebody type of thing. It doesn't really matter one way or the other. Right. The perception of the arbitrariness of it is, is the point. The point on any punishment for it to, to be successful is it has to relate to whatever happened. And it can't be seen as arbitrary. If it is seen as arbitrary, I'm sure anyone who has kids can tell you. If a, a kid does something wrong and then you punish them a week later for it, they, they're going to have no idea what you're punishing them for. And it's not going to make a difference in the behavior. Because you're you're taking right. so long to punish them, right? That makes a lot of sense. You'll go to jail like a lot. A lot of times you'll get caught. You'll go to jail immediately after the whatever happens. But then the whole process of going to prison that takes years to to do that. So so the whole thing about going to prison there's that first off the direct correlation it doesn't relate, and it also is not it doesn't seem related. Well, let's go into the arbitrariness because if your kid is caught shoplifting and you... If your child feels like he's going to get punished one way or the other, whether he does something or whether he doesn't do something, or if you feel right. like you know punishments are meted out more extreme for things that, that, are, that are less severe or you know, whatever, you know. That's, yeah, he's not, gonna li- he's not likely to understand the consequences of, his, of any kind of behavior. Yeah, if if you're unpredictable with your punishments, if the if the if you're totally unpredictable when handing out your punishments, then it's not going. Then your punishments are not going to pre- prevent anything. They're just going to do whatever, anything, and then the person is just going to exp- if they get, they're just going to try not to get caught. That's going to be the whole the whole name of the game. And we know from being in prison that that's the name of the game in prison. <sighs> yeah, that is one with, with the way that pr- the the way that they write rules and so forth in prison is just ridiculous. You can't possibly live by the rules. And anytime, and they're written in such a way that if they want to, they can always just come in there and find some, some rule you're violating and do and, and uh, punish you for it. I had the hardest time so you, explaining this today. I, I had to, I had to try and explain this today with um, how, when COVID hit and first off, I had to explain that, that our, for both of us, the hardest time that we had to do in prison was at um, when we made parole and then we got to the treatment, like the, 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 the part that was supposed to be rehabilitation, the like. The, pre, the pre-release the, rehabilitative the, thing. Yeah, the pre-release. So th- here's the thing about prisons, at least in Texas, there, there is very little they offer as far as rehabilitation that the state offers. They have their it own. It does change depending on what unit you're on. But like the ones that we were on are just places to throw people away. Stringfellow unit is just a toilet for, string, for humans. Yeah, but like Stringfellow, think about what they offered. Everything they offered was either from the, like religious groups, like from the church or from the Jewish program or from or from an outside group or like, like a... Bridges to life or whatever, that was, that's from a church. That's not, that is not something offered by the state. Um, the only things that you could maybe say were offered by the state were like changes in cognitive intervention. But those are technically offered by Wyndham School District, which I guess you could say, okay, maybe that's part of the state. And you could say carpentry, plumbing, and trades. Trades, and then if, if you're on one of the two units that have college. And the whole and all all of the hundred units that are in TDC, there's two units that have college on it. Um, but that that's your rehabilitation. You have two classes that are on most every unit. Cognitive intervention and changes changes you can't even get to until you've made parole. Cognitive intervention you can take once, 
every like 10 years. The the trades and everything are not available on every unit. Maybe there's maximum of two on any given unit from what I've seen. So when you finally, you make parole, now all of a sudden you ha- they'll, a lot of the condition of parole is that they'll put you into a program upon release. Which is also arbitrary. Not everybody gets that. Some people get, uh, and walk for, out for the door. whatever reason, some people walk right out the door and other people have to go to some kind of program. Yeah. I mean, unless you're like some kind of sex offender or something like that, all sex offenders have to go through a program. They have a much different condition. I'm assuming that most, uh, most people that are there for some kind of uh, drug related offense also have to go through some kind of uh, mm-hmm. treatment before they leave. It, Although that's like Ben David didn't do it. The guy that we know, uh, the guy that we know. Uh, ben David case. could have his own episode right there. But yeah. He, he could, but you know, he never did it. But then again, he just discharged his time. That's the thing is that if you're trying to leave early, if you're trying to make it basically like when I say leave early, it's make parole. Leave. Most people though that are, that are in prison for those type of offenses though don't have kind of time they're not going to make parole anyways you're just there for too short a period of time get less than 10 year sentence then they're probably going to hold you for the overwhelming majority of that sentence right people with double digit time tend to want to try and get out like like double digit years worth of time they're trying to make parole so they can leave because that is a very long time to be in prison but there are guys who are in there who have like three year sentences in prison time, that's in and out. They'll probably stay on a transfer facility throughout the entire time, most of the time. Right. They're, they're not trying to hear it. They'll get, they'll, they're happy to just get a whole bunch of cases so they can stay off a of field well, squad. Yeah, and plus, their whole entire experience in prison is radically different than that of someone else. I mean, that's, that's a whole another episode in and of itself as well, Randy. The difference between me, I have to make parole to get out. So, I'm walking this razor, this tightrope every day in between what inmates expect of me and what the state expects of me to not catch any cases, but at the same time, not, not be some, not be victimized by, by inmates and so forth. Whereas, you know, the next guy who not gonna, doesn't have any time at all and doesn't have to worry about parole, that guy can come over there and knock my block off. He can come over there and just, I mean, violently assault me. And it will be with no consequence whatsoever. So, you know, you have to... We had to, you have to navigate this landscape of, of insanity. You're trying to avoid those kind of a uh, At the trustee camp, it was, we, this is what we would see all the time. Trustee camp is minimum security. So we would, there's no fence. Well, there's usually no fence around it. There was a fence around um, the trustee camp at Stringfellow, but it's the minimum security for inmates. I was on the trustee camp. And a lot of guys at the trust camp, they usually don't have a whole lot of time either, or they're they're usually not there very long. They're usually um, they're about to make parole. Like I couldn't even go on to the to the trustee camp until I was close to making parole. I saw happening all the time is there'd be a guy who'd be walking on cloud nine, be telling everyone how excited he is to make parole. He'd be telling them everyone about his plans. Be talking about, you know, ooh, ooh, I got into my girl outside. She wants to get back together. He'd be showing all these pictures. And then all of a sudden you'd hear, oh, he got locked up because what's his face came over and just freaking knocked him out right in front of the lieutenant. And like, and yeah, got, a blatant attempt to try to, uh, to keep this guy from being able to make his parole. Cause go home. Because some guys can't, if you're, if you're a guy who's on that trustee camp for, and you have, you know, 10 more years, which there was, there were a few of them, you know, had 10 more years left. And then this guy is going home and is all excited and you're, you don't want to hear about it anymore. Well, you can do that. You can go, you can, you'll lose your trustee status for, for hitting that guy, but you can go back. You'll, you'll drop your status. You'll go back to, you'll go to either medium custody or general population, but you'll move back up real quick and you'll become a trustee, you know, within usually a year. Um, you'll be back at the camp. Actually, a lot of times I saw that within like six months. It's crazy, but you do see that occasionally. I, we saw it a lot. I saw that like a handful of times before I left. I'd see a lot of times guys would, right before the end, they'd be smoking K2 in the bathroom. They'd still be able to make parole. Like, it, you know, they get oh, caught. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's what I'm saying about the difference between someone in the position of he's going home no matter what. I'm discharging my sentence in a matter of months compared to someone like me who, I mean, 
for some reason or another, just could not make full vote no matter how good I was. Right. You're dealing with that kind of circumstance. We've actually talked quite a bit, but I, I don't think we've kind of hit the main points on this, but we've talked about a good good bit about, um, those are, yeah, about do, the issues. Those are need to be prisons. Does there need to be prisons? Does prison need to exist? Here's my main thing about prisons. When you're when you're inside prisons, you've got officers who are constantly just beating you down. It's just wearing you down, telling you what to do, trying to write you cases or going through your stuff, or you're working for free for the state, and you're always in the wrong. Slavery. Uh, yeah, uh, you're you're all you're, you're always wrong. You're 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 always you're always wrong. You are always assumed to be wrong. If you say something, there you are assumed you're you're a criminal, and that is how you're seen. They that, actually te- that's part of the training of of uh, TDC guards at the academy. They literally tell them that, that everything we say is a lie, and you it comes off never to believe anything. It is very abundant. If if I listen to anyone out here the way that they listen to us or don't listen to us, that person would never want to deal with me ever again because they would choose to. The only reason we dealt with the guards is because we had to, or the officers. That's prison. And and in prison, like you were saying, the big thing I want to point out that you said was that, is that when you're in there, we don't learn to follow the rules. We learn how to get around them. We are constantly... Yeah, because you we really, do- you have to. That's, that, was the, that was the whole point of this long spiel. Yes, is really a, a learning how to manipulate and navigate around the uh, circumstances you've been put in, but not necessarily to become a better person. How to put on the facade of a good person, but no one in TDC believes it anyways. <laughs> they don't believe it, and they're always looking for you. But it's basically how to go undetected. And I will say, the like one of my favorite phrases: um, "lace up," getting laced up. That was I had to get laced up about how to break the rules and when to break the rules. Because I didn't want to, I was under, like, my whole thing when I came to prison was, I want to make parole as soon as possible, so I'm going to do everything right. You came to prison, or at least I should say, not, maybe not necessarily to prison, I think you were a little bit disillusioned by the time you got to prison, but you went into the courtroom initially with the idea that everything that you'd heard on seen on TV about the motivations of the courts and prison and all this other type of stuff is about rehabilitation, it's about becoming a better person, it's about remorse it's about this it's about that and you went there with every intention of doing exactly the right thing and becoming the person that you that they wanted you to be and then you and you found out in the courtroom you found out that that's not what it was about and then you really had it drilled into you no i by the time you got to prison i thought no that's you know it's the crazy part even as bad as the courtroom was i still i went in when i was locked up i'm like all right that courtroom was bad but that was just the courtroom now i'm going into prison and now I'm going to show them how, you know, what a good person I am and that I'm trying to work on myself and that I'm trying to be a good person. And when I got in there and I tried tried to go to, like, classes and things like that, that backfired. Going to class, going to anything to actually try and help improve yourself, it means more interactions. You classes. Class, so you're I call about like academic classes, or are you talking about what are you talking about? There's no academic classes, and, and when I was in county, there was no academic classes. These were my options in in uh, in county. So these Mo- are like like religious things or something. Like- yeah, so so I'll, I'll go through them. Monday church, Tuesday Bible study. And you're Jewish, by the way. I'm so. I'm Jewish, right? So and there, there's, <laughs> it's not like it's. None it, of this is- it's it's not non denominational. It's just, the, but these are this is what you get. This is it. Period. So Monday church, Tuesday Bible study, Wednesday Catholic church, Thursday Thursday is AA, which was that was very exciting, and then Friday is church again. So those are my options, and that's what I call classes. And so I'm going to I'm not going to church, but I I'm going to this Bible study because I do want I, like I want to study the Old Testament is part of the Bible, and I want to study it some more. I actually go in there. And I'm asking, one thing was these volunteers that are coming in and doing the Bible study. That was hard times for all of us on that one, especially <laughs> being, especially me being Jewish. I was like, I, oh gosh, I need, I'm going to have to remember the story about me asking questions and the Aryan Nation guy right behind me with a, the swastika tattooed on his head following up. But that, but we're going to, oh, yeah. we're, we're going to save that story for another day. Those are what I'm calling classes. It's n- nothing. Really, no one's recording any of this either. The only person who would record it would be me, 
and I'm not recording it because I'm like, once again, I'm just trying to show that I'm a good person. Every time I try and leave, you know, you, cause they call out, they call out when one of these things is going on and then I go with the group, but then you have to interact with officers along the way. If someone acts up in your group, then the whole group is in trouble. It's not just one person or whatever. Maybe a riot just started and now you're going to be locked down in the hallway and you're going to be sitting there for an hour. You don't know what's going to happen. No one's recording and going, man, Ryan's a really nice guy and I think he's really rehabilitated. No one, and no one's from the parole board no. is there. Parole board is, no, is none taking of the guards, note. None of the guards are recording your behavior. None of, none of their opinions about you would matter anyways, even if they were. No one from parole knows anything about you whatsoever other than you know, some basic statistics that they're seeing on a piece of paper that have no reflection on reality whatsoever. But if you asked your average inmate that was living on a dorm about Ryan Ford, it would be a completely different story. It, the, the opinion you could get from there would be very accurate. The people that are, I could pinpoint people that were going to come back to prison very easily. It's not hard to, to identify if you're living in a prison environment with someone. Who's learning their lesson and who hasn't? Or who's coming back and who's not? I totally agree with that. Oddly seems like they oftentimes choose to send the person home who's a 100% guarantee that he's coming back to prison over the person that 100% not. You were the, one of the rare cases that made your first parole that was a certainty not to come back. But then again, there were some extreme circumstances that were surrounding that as well. That was, that. was Yeah, to me, the, uh, the only reason I made parole was the planet's lining. That's a good breakdown of what's going on in prisons. As an alternative, before I went to prison, I went to treatment. Why well, did you go to treatment, Ryan? I went to treatment because I was, I was drunk when I killed someone and I went to treatment not because I chose to um, I went to treatment because my lawyer recommended to my family that I go to treatment and then my family recommended to me why, why did your uh, why did your lawyer recommend this rainforest what was it was this a part of his, his uh, legal strategy for the courtroom he thought it was it would part reflect of, well upon you he thought it would look good I think in the courtroom he thought, honestly, I'm not entirely sure, but he probably did think it would be a good. What my lawyer was thinking of is he what he wanted, I think, most of, from me was he wanted to take my trial to a jury in front of a jury. And if I went to to re, like went to treatment, that is something he could have presented in front of a jury that would have looked very favorable for me. After the like of immediately after the accident, I went into a treatment facility that would have looked very favorable for me. Now, I wasn't thinking about that because at the time, I'm just trying to stay out of prison. Like I'm just in I don't want to go to prison. I'm going to do everything that I think would be the best thing for me. I'm not thinking about the my any issues with alcohol or anything like that. Because it wasn't like I was drinking every day in my case. It was the fact that I was when I did drink. I would drink too much. And on top of that, I had epilepsy and seizures. And so I'm I'm kind of, my family and I are kind of blaming the seizures at this point. Like I had a seizure and blah, 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 blah. But then I am voluntold <laughs> to, to go to this treatment. Treatment. I killed the epilepsy uh, uh, argument. Yeah. Argument. Yeah. So the, so when I go to treatment, you have to volunteer to go to treatment. That's the biggest thing. Even if it's because everyone around you wants you to go, you have to, you have to be the one who says yes. You have to say, yes, I'm going, that I have some sort of issue with drugs or alcohol, with some sort of substance or whatever. So I went and I'm like, all right, yes, fine. Then I had to start going over everything. The first thing is, is when you go into treatment is all in different levels. And the first thing you have to go into is you, you basically start in a hospital room where you detox. I hadn't drank in weeks at this point, but I still have to spend 24 to 48 hours in this detox and just sit there. And then I'm integrated into the inpatient facility with the groups. When I go in there, the thing is, is even from the moment of detox, everyone is worried about me. They're worried about what's going on. They're, they're worried about how I'm doing. They're making sure that I'm all right. It's like any other hospital stay. They're checking in on me, making sure I'm okay. When I move to the next to inpatient, same thing. They're all concerned. I've got a counselor. I work with one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm also working in groups. And there's a bunch of people, like everyone knows me. So just like in prison, there's a group of people who know me inside and out. But unlike prison, there is a staff member who is always there with me. So like, like always there with all of us. 
So they know us inside and out too. Like they know us too. And they're also, they're very well educated in addiction and substance abuse and all that kind of stuff. They understand what's going on with each of us. And not only that, I find out that all these people, every single person from the person who's running the pill window to the person, the, from medical to my counselor, to all, like all the different counselors, the people running the group, to the people running the food line, they all meet at the beginning of the day and they discuss what issues they're seeing in all the different patients. And they're discussing everybody and what they're seeing, what's going on to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Wow. Yeah. Pretty intense. It is super intense. And so they know exactly what is going on and who's pulling what. Look, Very personalized treatment there. There was one time where there was this one guy who he had was super antisocial. He, he, he had a lot of issues going on. It wasn't just substance abuse was like a side issue from the, the mental health stuff that he had going on. And no one wanted to deal with him. He reminded me a lot of my cousin who has like autism. So I went and talked to him and I was trying to, like I tried, like when I talked to him, he calmed down a lot because I had a lot of patience with him. I remember one day, one of the nurses actually got fired because one of the patients said that she had violated HIPAA, which it, it's really easy to violate HIPAA. <laughs> I never knew how easy it is to violate HIPAA on that. If you say something that you're not supposed to know to someone else or to something like that or to one of the count because like i said because they're always talking to each other all the time if she says something about a patient that the uh, that they're not supposed to know yeah they're walking a tightrope with the with the information right they gave but she said she let something slip about this person's illness or situation that she should not have and it cost her a job right and so she got let go and then right as she's leaving she finds me right after talking to him and she grabs me and she goes she goes, I see what you're doing out there. Don't think that people don't see what you're doing. And it means a whole lot. Then she had to walk off. That's when I knew that like people were all watching all of this. So there they were. Like they they were watching that. So inpatient, your day is scheduled. You're going to have meetings. You, you've got your meeting with your counselor. You've got your meeting with, you have several groups each day. Then you have outside groups coming into the to the facility. Your day is pretty much scheduled from beginning to end. Do you have lights out at a certain time? all that stuff. There's really, there's, you've got a couple hours of free time, but there's no time where you're sitting in like a day room with TVs blaring, playing dominoes. There's no time for that. You're too busy. There's too much stuff going on. Basically the treatment facility is too involved. And then you move to the next level, which is you're starting to get back involved with the community. You're, you're you can now start doing stuff in the outside world you're still doing groups, you're still meeting with your counselor, but now you're starting to set goals for yourself, you're starting to look at jobs, and you're starting to to get ready to leave, like permanently, you're, you're starting to look for housing. Where I was, I was on apartments on the hospital grounds, but I could leave the hospital grounds pretty regularly. So when I needed to look for a place to live, when I needed to go look for work, I could do all of that stuff along with going to the regimented meetings, which you only have half as many when you're at this next phase. Then the next thing for me was then I would move out to sober living, which is a house out in a community where the main thing is, is I have a certain number of hours of work, a certain number of hours of volunteering. And as long as I'm keeping up with that, and as long as I do my house, my chores, I'm good, and sometimes they have like random UAs and things like that. Rainy rainforest. I don't mean to cut you off because I know you're in the middle of a flow of thought here, but I would like to know exactly how this relates to prisons being necessary or not. The the point I was trying to say with all of this. Maybe you need to jump jump a little bit ahead. No, no. The, I was about to wrap it up. the The point is, is that so as opposed to prisons, this was taking me from society, taking me out of society, and then slowly reintegrating me back with better behaviors. I was 100% better by the end of it than I was from the start of it, and I was slowly reintegrated back in after being in treatment. Whereas in prison, I was pulled right out of society, taken into to prison, then introduced to a whole bunch of bad behaviors, then basically uh. thrown right back out into society and then hope for the best. There already exists a way 
to pull people who are having problems out of society and then reintroduce them back in with better behaviors. But we don't use that. Instead, we use prisons. And that's what I'm trying. That's where this relates. Allow me to try to throw out some arguments I would think that someone might have to your uh, to your point. Possibly I could see that for more minor offenses. But what would you do for, say, the case of more serious offenses like uh, people that have uh, extreme crimes like a bank robbery or something like that or, or some kind of home invasion robberies or assaultive behavior? or even worse, killing somebody, murder. I think it's all going to be same. The, the, what happens when you go into treatment is they basically, it's a full breakdown of what's going on with you. It's a breakdown of what's going on with you mentally and emotionally. It's a breakdown of what's going on with your family. It's a breakdown of what you've got in your bank account and what's going on there, your job history and all that kind of stuff. And all of those things you work on. You look at where the problem area is and they're all pointed out to you. If you're robbing a bank, why are you robbing the bank? What are, you, what are you doing? What's the problems here? Why aren't why aren't you working a nine to five? Why do you feel like this is necessary? Why is this going on? If you're going around, if you're a serial killer, why? Why is that appealing to you? What's going on in your head? They have access to CAT scans and, and MRIs. Let's take a look. Now, I'm not going to say that all of these are solvable, that all of these are going to be 90-day fixes in and out, but I am going to say that treating you them... Can see, you can see that there are people that are that are extremely dangerous that quite obviously can't just be left to a roam our neighborhood. Yeah, there are people who can't... You can't just let them roam around in society. There are people who need more help. I did 90 day treatment and that worked out great for me. Okay. Some people need 120 days. Some people, we may not have a treatment yet developed that will, that will get to the core of what's going on. However, throwing them in a prison doesn't do anyone any good because now that person that we don't have a treatment for is now putting officers in danger putting other inmates in danger and we have to pay money like as a society to house them in this super dangerous situation. So we're not doing anyone any good with the Neg set that we have now. Negatively influencing the prison environment that he's in. Right. Possibly, which is going to spill out somewhere or another back into the streets whenever those people that have been subjected to that are uh, let go. Even if he's not let go, his negative influence is still there. And of course, well, then there's the other side of the argument that I see a lot of people making. Well, then, okay, death penalty. The guy needs to be just put down. But uh, there again, I can't believe I just did that the second time I brought up the death penalty. But that would be the next argument, the next logical argument some people would make. I mean, if they, they so agreed with such a right. concept. First off, if we were perfect and we could make all decisions perfectly, then we could talk about the death penalty. But the thing is, we keep on every time there's a death penalty, there's exonerations. And we have yet to make perfect decisions on, on guilt and things like that. This also gets to the core of what I think is the problem. This is this is one of the things that I want one of the points that I want to make. I think that the, that the reason why we have prisons and one of the main reasons why we think prisons are necessary is because w what you're trying to say is, is that there's a way of dealing with people where you come at it from a perspective of, I, I see that you're hurting, you're something wrong, your behavior is a symptom of something else. I want to make you a good person and reintegrate you back into society. It's sort of like a familial type of thing. If you have a, a, a family member that is doing something that's harmful to themselves, a drug addict or something, and you want to, you want to, they might be stealing money from you. I mean, I mean, they might be going into your mom's purse or something and stealing money. You're going to get mad at them for a second, but ultimately everything is going, coming from a place of extreme care and wanting them to get better and come back to you and embrace them as a full blown family member that's healthy and, and living right. That's where, that's the perspective you're coming from as a society. Am I correct, Rainforce? That you want to see that same concept. That is absolutely that, that, that is absolutely correct. Well, we're not we're not seeing that. We instead we have this very cold mentality of us and them and there's people that are bad, there's people that are good, there's people I don't like. And I like the idea of, of, of just being able to, to get rid of those people. Just being able I don't have to look at them anymore. I think it's just as criminal and just as harmful as any crime that someone might do. That attitude I think is a cancer in our society. Right. It's a cancer in American society that goes to the beginning of its society where we had an us and them mentality about different races and so forth. The idea that someone could be so callous in their heart as to think that it's okay to insult 
slaves another group of people. They wait, people would wake up every morning, go to work, and it was just, this is how daily life is. Yeah, I, I beat these people into making them work for me. And they didn't have any problem with it. They saw it as normal. Now we're aghast at it. We need to get to that point where we're aghast at the concept of sending someone into a cage, putting someone in a cage. I, exactly I totally agree. Concept. And a matter of fact, we are enslaving those people just as well. It, it is the exact same thing as slavery as far as the labor part goes. We are doing exactly that. That's absolutely right. And I want to say something else because some people, it's hard for them to get the moral aspect of it. So I'm going to argue from just the, the productive aspect of it too. Like there was another guy I met at um, at Ramsey and he, very similar to the guy I was talking about in treatment, he was not mentally there. In fact, the first time I met him, he thought he was talking about how he was an alien from another planet. Ramsey has a lot of cases like that. Anyone who's young and who's there is generally ha is a, has a lot of mental health issues. The reason he was there is because he had stabbed his uncle 45 times. Oh. It, uh, yeah, yeah. So he had some serious time to do. The the thing about him is that when he when he says that like you wouldn't believe it cuz he's small timid guy. He's he doesn't seem like he's going to go out and go go into a rage but the thing is he's not mentally stable at all. And you could see that he's very much affected by his environment. And you could watch it change based on what's going on around him. He kept on getting moved around because he liked to talk to himself in his cell and he's got all these mental issues and you can only imagine living with someone who's got mental issues inside of a... Oh, a, I've been through that. That is horrible. Yeah. That is horrible. People kept on getting out of the cell. Well, finally, this one guy thought he could tough him out of his mental issues. Be like, look, you're not going to do this. You're not going to do this. You're not going to talk to yourself like that. It's like, I'm trying to sleep. I'm trying to do this. You, you're like, you, he's going to be the tough guy who owns the cell. And then one day, you know, the guy who has mental issues was doing some drawing on, on his bunk. And he spills all the ink in the pen, goes all over his Sully's bunk. So now the Sully walks in and there's ink all over the bed. And he's like, next time you come in here, it's on. Know what time it is. This is, it's, he's panicking. He's, he's panicking about this, about the whole thing, about what, uh, about what's happening. He's in a total panic and he's sitting there just right outside the cell door the whole time, just talking to him, just, you know, trying to. To, to plead bargain with him, please don't, I don't want to fight you. I don't want to fight you. And then count time comes around. And this old man is doing count and they're, he's trying to move everyone to the other side so he can count everybody. And he won't get away from the cell door. And the old man's yelling, count, count, count. Finally walks across the day room to get to, get to this guy. And he says, hey. And then the guy turns around and just knocks the officer out, knocks him out, starts beating him down and then picks up the, this clipboard and breaks the clipboard over the officer. Inmates start charging. This was a, pan, a panicked response. This is to having to, he, to have to, rather than have to go back into his cell and deal with his cell. Right. He was no longer, he was, he was in a total state of fear, like at this point, because he knew he, if he had to go back into that cell, if he had to deal with anyone, he was going to have to, he was about to be attacked. Right. He he beat that officer up, that old man. Old man had to go to the, to the hospital. Inmates uh, tried to pull him off. He ended up getting more time, probably. More more than likely. He got an assault charge and then went to SEG and probably had to do about 10 years in administrative segregation before he was oh, he's, yeah, eligible he's, to get out of that. Yeah, he's going to be in SEG for a long time. And also, when he's alone, he's said it many times before, like, if, he, if you leave him alone, he will torture himself. He hears voices. He hears all sorts of stuff when he's left alone. He likes being around a lot of people. So to go to SEG, which is solitary, would be the greatest torture of all for him. I have heard stories of what happens to people people who self-tattoo themselves and cut off appendages and stuff like that in, in SEG. We've had, we've seen some issues like that in Stringfellow. I, I was a... Uh... For a while there in prison, for years, I was a janitor, an SSI, which is is what the common colloquialism for a prison janitor is. What that means, I'm, I'm not really sure exactly what SSI stands for. I was a for, in SEG on Darrington, and Darrington has one of those 
very uh, old school uh, cell block. They have like four large cell blocks that they use for, for seg. And it's the old kind, right? The kind they don't have tables in them. The, you know, the kind of like you see on string fellow, the cells there, except there's only one person living in. And there were guys that were in there that had been in seg for 20 years or more. They've been sitting in a cell by themselves for 20 years or more. And I can tell you this, there's a certain point at which everybody gets a little, there's a, being alone by yourself in a cell like that all the time for years and years is going to have a, it's going to have an effect on everyone. It doesn't always like really severely damage people, but no one comes out of there unchanged. Some of those guys, they were gone. They were just absolutely stark raving crazy. And it was the time alone that it did it. And, and the real the, I, isolation. The real kicker on this story about the about this kid is that he had asked. He'd gone to the officers like every day before that at so many times multiple times a day ask saying hey i'm having issues with my cellmate can you please move me i'm like and he he broke it down for him he said he's like like look i have issues this guy doesn't understand and we're it's about to get real bad can you please move me and yeah that's that's another bad thing about texas prisons is their classification situation and how they they don't care you know whenever you come to them with 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 things like that the way that they do clad the put people in cells in prison or put people in any kind of living environment is completely at at random They, they you do not you i mean imagine this uh people out there in podcast land that have never been to prison uh mood go and get your bed take your mattress and move it into your bathroom and whatever else you want to take with you i mean you could you could take your common you know living items in there i i would even make it more comfortable on you than we had in our cell take your tv take your take your cd player you know that type of thing and then go then drive down the street find some complete stranger standing around that hates your guts more than likely and pick them up and then move them in there with you and stay in there for two weeks with that person. Stay inside that bathroom for two weeks with that person. Tell me how, tell me how you think that would turn out. What, what kind of a, and that's what prison, that's what you cell need, block situation in prison is you like. You need to find someone with a drug problem. You have to have that. Uh, just find, fi- some, find somebody that, that is an absolute racist <laughs> and that's of an opposite <laughs> race of you. Completely yes. hates you. you do, yeah, that's absolutely it has and then to, you gotta sleep in a room with this person yeah they can't be the same race that's a requirement that's uh texas they're disgusted prisons disgusted by they're also disgusted by your race and everything you do is gonna it, they uh they feel as content they're contaminating their environment with your whiteness or with your blackness or with your mexicanness or whatever it is and, and you have to learn how to deal navigate this right you have to, i mean a guy like me if you want to go home you have to learn how to deal with this without you just have to learn how to deal with it you have to find a way around it or oftentimes there is no way around you're just simply going to end up in some kind of violent situation and you can talk to the guards you can go talk to the rank whatever and they don't care they ignore it they want you to get into fights they want it to end up being in uh, that kind of a situation i i would say this as someone who used to be married if you're married you you and your wife have to live in the bathroom you're, all your cooking all of your you change when you get back home from work you have to immediately go to the bathroom that's anything you do has to be with you with your partner in the bathroom then you're gonna have to live that way for an undetermined amount of time see how long that relationship lasts as much as you you love your partner right now that, that is kind of funny because there's been circumstances you know the way i uh, over the years in prison one of the ways i learned how to just deal with that is just tune it out and that's got its own dangers and all that you can't you can't do that really altogether either one of the few luxuries that are allowed in prison are radios they, have, they sell radios on commissary that have headphones and so i would just put my headphones on and completely tune out the rest of the reality. I just put my blanket over my head, tune it out and send myself into uh, some kind of meditative state where I'm imagining something else altogether. But I got to tell you, in those shakedowns or the the lockdown times, whenever you're stuck in a cell for for seven to 10 days with the same person, the lockdown starts, they shut those doors and you're not going anywhere. And you can be best friends with your cellie. You you can have a cellie that you absolutely get along with on almost every level and and, and are are having as good a prison relationship and uh, cellmate relationship as you can possibly be having. And by the end of that 10 days, you're going to hate this guy's gut. There's just no way around it. You can imagine if you go into the situation into in a bad situation with some with a person that has mentally ill or whatever else it is a nightmare it is hell on earth right main point i wanted to say about that story is that so that guy there's probably nothing we could do for him there's probably no treatment for whatever he whatever's going on in his head 
There's probably no cure for it. There may be no way to make him safe outside in society. Where he, There's certainly a more compassionate way of dealing with it. Right. If he's in an environment where he felt safe, if nothing else, even if you don't think that's more moral, all right, even if you want to punish him or whatever, but if he was in an environment where he felt safe, where he would treated with some semblance of a, like at least listen to when he says, hey, I feel like this this, this situation is not safe for me. That guy would happily, he would draw every day. He made crazy art. He made crazy stories, which sometimes were hilarious because they were so crazy. He could produce things that could go out into the world and the, and they would be great. So he could still contribute to society, even though we couldn't have him in it. And he would be happy to do that. He would be thrilled to do that. But prison is not a situation where he could do that in. Honestly, I am scared to this day of what's happening to him in there. <laughs> your concern for this person you think that uh the circumstances are one harmful to him and not making him better but making him worse yeah i'm afraid if that some sort of harm will befall him because of the, the situation because oh yeah well yeah and you're right that, that, that's a very real that's a very real reality in prison like you described the celly that he had to deal with that's back to the core of what i'm talking about this whole thing i keep on bringing up about the systemic problem that is running the, the through the whole entirety of our criminal justice system from one end to the other. Remember I mentioned earlier to you that even the inmates are affected by it. They get the same disease. And that's what you're talking about right there when you're dealing with this inmate whose idea is, I'll show you how to deal with this guy. I'll be just as hard as prison is on me. I'll be just, and the criminal justice system is on me. Well, that's how I'll deal with this guy. Because for some reason, I mean, another, I mean, it gets in the head of everyone that that's how you handle these kinds of problems. You just, you punish, punish, punish. I remember watching the episode of The Simpsons where uh, they were passing, uh, somehow or another, The Simpsons family was passing through Florida and they committed some kind of accidental crime on their way through some small county in Florida and they get sent to prison. And so you have this very charismatic, good-looking, uh, like, prison warden that's there who has a southern accent, and he's just the kind of person that, that everybody thinks, you know, is 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 charmed by. But he's running this prison. He's like, he's got the, the Simpsons out there, you know, slaving away, just in the harshest possible labor, field labor that you can imagine. And whenever they would mess up, he goes, oh, you know, uh, you guys are a real mess. I guess I'm just, you know, I wish I could quote this properly, but the point was he would say, I guess I'm just not whipping you hard enough, you <laughs> know. Right. His, his response to everything was to pull out a bullwhip and to start whipping people more. That is Texas and to some extent maybe the rest of America's way of handling all these problems. They just want to violently assault it. They want to take their anger out on it. It's coming from a place of vengeance and anger and not from a place of compassion and really wanting to help the society as a whole or the victim or stop potential victimhood. And it certainly isn't trying to root out the core of the criminal element uh, of what's the cause of the crime to begin with inside the person. It's not trying to return a good person to society, which is it's crazy from my perspective that I'm in right now, because as soon as you get out on get out of prison and get on parole, they expect you to be this exemplar member of society. Well, I mean, why did they expect that? Whatever they did, whenever they they've absolutely thrown you away and told you that you'll never be that, and the reason that was the excuse for throwing you away to begin with is that you are not that at your root and core and can't be that. And then whenever you get out, they excuse they then all of a sudden it's completely expected of you. Yeah, you're expe you're held Weird. to higher standards than a anyone else in society. About that is you need people like coming out to be better. You I I totally agree. You need the people coming out of prison to be better than what they were. Otherwise, if they're coming out the same or worse, then you're or da damaged. Right. Then they are doing they're going to end up harming the society you're putting them in. So it does right. not it does I, I think a lot of what we're seeing and you know, there's been a lot of changes in Texas prison over the years. Whenever I first came to prison, uh prisons were a chaotic, just crazy madhouse of violence and just it was a mad dog kind of world that you got dropped into. You were literally expected to just deal with it on your own. Fend for yourself, you know, strong survive type of mentality and the guards wanted it. They, they absolutely, the guards, the wardens, everybody, Texas wanted it. This is what there, was their their idea that they would make prison so bad and so violent on the inside that it would make people not want to go. That, that, that That's what, how they would deal with it. So they did these 90-day shock things where those kind of 16-year-old kids you're talking about. Right. They just threw them to the dogs. They, they would throw, they didn't have youth offender programs back then like they do now. So they just took teenagers and threw them into completely adult prisons with a bunch of psychopaths so they'll be assaulted. And then what do they do? They don't come out of prison. Oh my God, I don't ever want to go back. They go, they come out of prison 10 times crazier than they ever were before. 
they come out of prison with the same, with now this survival of the fittest mentality. Do you remember the case of the of the guys that uh, drug James Bird to death in in Jasper? No. The guy, the dragon, the dragon case that happened. I think it was in the, in, either in the early 2000s or something like. That. It was a group of guys that were part of the Aryan Brotherhood. They got out. And they committed a horrible crime of dragging a black guy to death in Jasper behind a truck. They drug him behind a truck and he ended up dying. Horrible, horrible thing. And everybody, I remember when it happened, everybody was just dumbfounded. What was the purpose of this crime and all that? But whenever they talked to the parents of the people, of, especially one of the guys, one of the ringleaders of the whole thing, he was talking about how badly he was assaulted by blacks in prison. This was a response to his anger that he built up from the outright racism that wasn't just allowed, but was encouraged in prison in the early 90s. We're getting into a whole nother area here but in, in whenever you came whenever i came to prison prisons were all self-segregated the inmates segregated themselves in every situation they could for cell blocks they the, the inmates didn't have any control over who you had for a cellie or things like that but when you went and sat down in a day room remember what a day room is uh rainforest yes i uh, remember what day room when, is. when when you went and sat down in a day room they had benches they, they have these rows of benches and the inmates, you'll notice immediately, well, there's all Mexicans sitting on these rows of benches. There's all blacks sitting on these rows of benches. And there might be, if you're lucky, one, if you're really lucky, two benches in a day room. Very small minority of white guys are able to sit. And then there's another bench that's probably, going to, there's going to be another two benches in the back rows of where the blacks sit and where the white, of where the Mexicans sit. And those benches were for, those were the, that's what they called hoe benches. Hoe was the, is the uh, abbreviated version of a whore, uh, as if they're all pimps. These are, these are guys that they were forcing uh, into servitude of some kind. They would take white guys that came in because they were such a small minority. And they would beat them into uh, they would beat them into submission if they couldn't fight back or got to the point where they didn't want to fight back or it just wasn't worth it to them. They'd either make them pay through commissary or they're like or, or, or turn them into some kind of personal house slave or something like that. Or you know, uh, in some more extreme cases, they would rape them and, and that type of thing. It was horrible, horrible situation that you that you that these that people were getting thrown into. That was the that was the living environment. That was the everyday thing. So when you walked into the day room, here it is. You're looking at these benches, right? You had you literally had to fight just to sit down on any one of these benches, unless of course you wanted to, to allow yourself to be somebody somebody's a uh, piece of chattel. Well, then yeah, then you can go and sit down on one of those benches. But if you if you wanted to maintain any kind of uh, personal respect or, or semblance of security and safety, then you had to you, you well you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to to fight your way onto one of these benches, and you had had to sit down too that was another thing by the way the guards were going to yell at you to sit down which was going to make a statement no matter where you sat down you where you sat down in the day room sent a signal to everyone else in the day room and the bitches here's another thing the bitches that were segregated by race that was just the uh tip of the iceberg when you got within the races the the bitches were all segregated either by gangs or by the cities that you lived in so if you had two white bitches you're gonna have one row of white bitches it was gonna be all aryan brotherhood guys could sit on this bench and if you weren't an aryan brotherhood you better not be sitting on that bench and and maybe the front bench would be guys that weren't affiliated with any one of the Aryan uh, groups that they had in prison. And, this, and similarly with all the other ones, you know, the Crips, the Bloods had their benches, the, the Dallas had their bench, Houston had their bench, all this type of thing. How do we get on that? I'm starting to lose. I know. Lose track I, of how we got there. It's such an extreme memory. <laughs> uh, it, it seems it seems nightmarish whenever I think back on it, on on how that stuff was. We're talking about, the, I got all that James Bird thing. Right. We're talking about how people came out of prison much worse than the way they went in. And there were so many extreme examples of people that were went in for minor crimes and came out came out of prison psychopaths because of that situation. I mean, the racism, I can't tell you how many, just from the perspective of, of I, I mean, I'm white, I'm Jewish. Uh, from the perspective of a white guy that, that came down to prison at a young age, you come down and you're, and you're in this extremely racially charged environment and you're going to be brutally beaten up several times by members of other races that hate your guts just because you're white. I, I sit in these day rooms and listen to conversations from guys that are in the uh, Nation of Islam and stuff like that where they're arguing amongst themselves whether it's okay to kill white babies because they might grow up and become a cop and arrest one of their kids or something. I mean, that was like, that was the level of, of, of what was considered a moderate amongst these people. Whether, if you would not kill a white baby, well then you, you were soft on 
on white people <laughs> type of thing. You're in this environment where, where you're surrounded by people like that and they are treating you horribly, horribly. So you see these guys and they join these games. People are aghast at the name of these games. Oh, the Aryan Brotherhood, how could you possibly join something like that? But it's because of the uh, of the situation that they were put in and, and what it does to your mind. The way that you feel like you need to deal with that whenever you come from the you know from the free world and you have, you don't have any racism or any severe racism at least within you and you might you know oh I've got black friends you know this that and the other and then you get there and all of a sudden you're completely hated and you're you're brutally abused and all sort of type of stuff and you have to harden yourself extremely psychologically physically in, in a lot of ways that and you have to do so really really quickly and one of the ways that they do that is by adopting these extremist points of view that they would not have ever had otherwise no one would they, none of these, most of these guys would never have come to those kind of conclusions otherwise but they do and then they end up joint they end up becoming true believers in it they get brainwashed by it they get out the they get out in the free world and keep this kind of ball rolling it it, 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 it was horrible it was horrible horrible what it was doing to people. People were not coming out of prison well. People were coming out of prison being extremely dangerous and harmful I mean, harmful to others. There's a whole other side of it, uh, of, of the sexual side of it. I mean, uh, there's a real problem with with people masturbating in public in prison at one point. There, there, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, masturbating on the female guards and all that. That's and that's still an issue, they're... but that's, that's I mean... That... It, it is still an issue, but it's not nearly the issue that it used to be, but it's still an issue. It, I mean, that's, that also there depends. There's something that it was doing... It depends on the unit. Yeah, it depends on the unit. But I think let's hold off on that. We're going we're gonna to have to wrap it up. <laughs> on this on on this one because we're going we're going all over the place right now. The Trying to we are, we are talking about are prisons necessary, and we I mean we started out trying to cover the fact that they were that they're not absolutely necessary, and you know that because they didn't always exist, right? But now we're showing that not only they're not necessary, but they just don't accomplish their stated goal. They don't they don't accomplish anything. All they accomplish, the only thing prisons accomplish is satisfying the darker side of all of our natures, the, ang the, uh, the side of anger that just wants to, to be rid of people and harm people because you feel like you've been harmed. And it's a vicious cycle that ends up affecting all of our society. Yes, absolutely. And that, I think that, that's what all these stories are trying to illustrate is that if you sit back and listen to this podcast and piece that, piece all these random disparate thoughts together i hope you come to that conclusion <laughs> and on that note we will call this one a day and we will continue on next week thank you so much the shakedown is recorded in luxurious longmont public media studios and our theme song shakedown is provided by envato elements <laughs>